Today on Between the Lines, a new way of looking at your work and life with my guest, Maynard Webb. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Maynard, as the COO of eBay, created the organizational structure that enabled the company to grow from millions in revenue to multi-billions in just a short time. As the founder of the Web Investment Network and on the board of Yahoo, he continues to help companies and individuals grow. Now with his book, Rebooting Work, he shares his knowledge on how to transform how you work and how you can become the CEO of your own destiny. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth. In, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the first thing to do. Maynard, it is a pleasure to have you here on Between the Lines. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Barry. I'm so delighted to be here. I look forward to the conversation. Well, you know, I'm going to have to stop because this is the first time the viewers are going to see I am not holding a book. I am holding an uh, e-reader. Until they pay me, I'm not saying which e-reader it is, <laughs> but I'm holding an e-reader. And what was funny, I decided not to do this this way until I read your book. And your book inspired me to be the first time to use the e-reader for the conversation because of the ability of the cloud. And I wanted you to, ex to tell us a little bit about the cloud since your whole new business structure is based off of operating on the cloud. Well, first, I'm thrilled to be the first <laughs> for you to, to actually do your reader on, our show, on the show. Uh, I think technology has changed everything. Um, we can do things today that we could only have imagined before. And the book is about what that means in our lives now that we have technology that lets you read that book wherever you are, get updates instantaneously on what's going on. The same is true with content in general. If you remember uh, when we were kids, you watched one TV show on one channel at the time they told you to show up, and if you didn't do it, you missed it. We didn't even have VCRs when I was a kid, right? Fast forward to today, and I can watch any content on any channel, uh, user-generated or you know, produced professionally, on any device, anywhere I am in the world, I am in control today. And a lot of our companies, you know, our, our consumers have gotten used to that freedom and they want it in their work world and our work world is still a little stodgier. Well, so. that was it. When I read about it in the work world and you talked about the cloud, what my son told me and what saved me literally eight to nine hours of work was the ability to highlight, send it up, to the cloud, back down to my computer to then take my notes. And it used to take me at least a day to transcribe it, all of the highlighted pages. So right off the bat, I said, I have to do this with Maynard because so much of your new workforce is just that way. Totally. And, and you know, the cloud is so powerful. Well, first, my work at eBay was an internet platform and a cloud computer, you know, it enabled all these millions of entrepreneurs to compete with these big companies by producing a product and then letting the whole world buy from them. Where else could you have had that before the internet existed, right? Right. It, it just was impossible. You had little mom and pop shops and all of a sudden you can be a store and you can have a storefront that can appeal to a global audience. And you take the same thing with the workforce and you say, well, I have all this technology, I have all this power, you know, the cloud, mobile, and social revolutions going on, why do I still have to get in my car and drive to an office and waste, on average, eight weeks a year commuting? Can I have more time with my family? And I can, can I have more time with my work? And can I, can I make my career and my work coexist better instead of having them be enemies? Well, that is what caught me, and these were the words. Work should be a place of inspiration and innovation. It should not, it cannot be unfulfilling, but for all too many, it is. And that is an uh, amazing concept when you think about it. It's, it's too 
it really shouldn't be that way. Do you know, Barry, um, our, in this world where our consumer world has gotten so rich and we have so much more choice and we have so much more excitement, enthusiasm, and so much more control, in this world where we're at an incredibly exciting time, our employees in the U.S. have less satisfaction than, you know, they have had in the last 15 to 20 years. Over 50% of people report that they're unhappy. I think that's criminal, you know, because I, it is the place you spend most of your time. You have to make all your economics there, right? So it should be a place that you're doing your life's work, that you're making a difference in the world, that you're enjoying it. Well, you know, it's in the introduction I used part of your main concept here, and that is becoming the CEO of your own destiny and to be the one in charge of your career and life. And that doesn't mean that you have to start your own company. It meant being a CEO in your own personal life and mission. And that's what I found so attractive. This was not just a business book, but it was a lifestyle book almost, a way of how to feel again that satisfaction. I, 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 I want to use the words the, from the Declaration, literally that pursuit of happiness, happiness, which is really the pursuit not just of having a good time, but the pursuit of enjoying your worth and your mission. We all have a purpose in the world. And what I feel compelled to do is help people get to their destiny and realize they can't cede control of that to anybody else. You know, I grew up in the paternalistic era and the company kind of took control of your career and your life, and as long as you did a good job and worked hard, you had a job for life. Well, companies don't exist long enough today to have a job for life, and so it has to be employee first, and I think you do better work when you realize it's all up to you, whether you start your own company or you work for a company, it's up to you. No one will ever care about your career nearly as much as you do. The one thing, though, you, I don't want to say warn us, but you, you, so you take the pie out of the sky, so to speak. When you do this, you, you end up with an unprecedented amount of responsibility. I believe those were your exact words. You, you begin to, you realize now that you have a mission, a purpose, and with that does come, by nature, responsibility. Yeah, I, I, and I, I don't want people to be afraid of that because it, it, you always had responsibility even when you ceded control of the company. Um, you had to still perform or you weren't gonna you know, have your career grow and you weren't gonna make the economics you needed. But when you realize it's all in your hands, there's no one else to blame or to get upset with. It's freeing, and, but you have to perform. And I don't want, I, you know, I grew up the hard way and I have uh, had amazing opportunities in my career, but there was hard work involved. And I think anytime you get all the way to where you're supposed to go, there's generally some hard work involved. And I don't want people to run away from that. I want, I, what I really want is for people's dreams to get married up with the reality of where they are and realize there's more in all of us and we can achieve more, but you have to take responsibility for doing that. And, and you say that, I love it, I'm going to read your words while I make them up. Meritocracy versus entitlement. I have gained significant freedom by embracing a mindset of meritocracy, where we really do have to achieve at our highest, in the best sense of the word, every moment. Yes. I, th I think any time you think, uh, so, I've had many, you know, many great jobs, and the higher up I got, you know, often people want to be nice to you, and you think, oh, I've arrived, so I got a big office, or somebody's going to go get my lunch for me, or go do something else. You know what? Anytime you think you deserve something, you're not actually creating your best work. I think you do your best work when you realize you have to get voted onto the team every day, that you know, whatever you did in the past is interesting and good and a foundation for where you are, but you have to d redo it every day. There is no safety net. And that 
I think it's so much, you're, you're so much stronger when you realize that I must do something that is worthy every day. The second you think I've arrived, I'm going to be great forever, danger, danger, danger. And I, I'm, I love football. I'm a San Francisco 49er faithful. The Super Bowl was a little tough at the end, but it was <laughs> a hell of a comeback. And, I, I'm um, also a, a major fan of it, the sport. I've never missed a single game on, that's on television, yeah, ever. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is an amazing sport, hard to do, and the number of people that play it in high school that actually make it to the pros is minuscule. And then when you get to the pros, it doesn't matter. Ray Lewis, one of the greatest linebackers of all time, won't be playing next year, and somebody else will take their place. So. I, I wonder why in a world where we all like pro football and there's a meritocracy, at least on talent there, we en enable so much poor performance in the world where the rest of us work. Ah, so true. You know, you have, I want to let the viewers know that this is not just a philosophical look at things. There's practical ways of looking at how you can achieve certain things. There's even a thing that you do called the framework, and we'll try to get into all of it. But the one thing I want to do is get into at least a few of the things in regards to the steps required to be the CEO of your destiny. And I always think that the first and last are always the most important. I know that's funny, but in this case, I think number two is as well. So at least going to hit those three, all right. that's all right. So the first one is aim high. And as this step is not easy, if truly done well, it will take energy and soul searching. That's, uh, Barry, I so appreciate that you caught that soul searching because, you know, I'm always amazed at how little time people really spend on where, um, where am I supposed to go in my life and my career? And, you know, we have all these folks that go on to Farmville to get validation by trading cows, and then they get upset that work isn't happening, but they spend no time in self-reflection mode on where am I meant to go? And so in the book, I talk about spending some good reflection time to figure out how you can figure how you decide where you're meant to go and I say stand on picture yourself standing on stage in front of the people in the world you admire and respect the most and tell them the story of what you've done for the last five years tell them the truth don't tell them the marketing spin at the end of that you're either going to have amazed them they're going to say, you're a capable individual. That's kind of what I would expect you to do. Or they're not going to be amazed. And the question is, what do you want out of that? Well, that's why I say step one and the last step are always the most important, because step five is the thing that gets you there. It says, step back and reflect. Right. Right. And that is what soul searching really is, when you can step back, get out of the spin, and reflect on what deep inside, because I think that's the other thing, is can we drill deep enough down inside our soul, literally, to see where that is? And if you don't take the time to do that, you may just continue doing what you're doing. Yeah, and I think that's what, I think, Barry, if you continue to do what you've been doing, and it's not inspiring to you anymore, I think you get dull, sleepy, bored, and, you know, maybe a little disenchanted. Um, the reflection is really, really important because it may, you know, what I'm doing today is so much different than what I was doing when I was the COO of eBay. But if I were at eBay being a COO right now, I would not be as happy because my, my desires and my journey has changed. It's been seven years that I've been out of the company and I had to reset what, where I was going and, and where I was heading. So that reflection step is really important to say, what's working, what isn't, was I right? You know, I mean, coming up with an idea on where you're gonna go when you're 30 may look different at 45 or 57 or, you know, 80. You know, there, that is not only so true, but it, it gives me a little goosebump as I think about it. And what it made me do is, and this is why, I mark number two as also so important right. because it's the spirit of and. And that in itself, I should just leave it at that, but it's, uh, I'll use your words, you can do more than you ever dreamed. Today we no longer have to think, 
in terms of either or. Right. The spirit of and go into that baby. Well, I used to call it the power of Anne, but everybody got nervous about that. So I tried to be more inspirational and call it the spirit of Anne, which is more fun. Okay. Um, I think we can accomplish so much more than anybody ever thought we could, but it starts with I can and how can I versus I can't. The second you're in win, lose, or either or, you immediately feel bad about the trade-offs you've made on one side. And if you, and if you can in your mind say, how can I do this? Um, I'll give you a, one of the things in my life that was an amazing opening for me is my wife and I were both career uh, workers and we had two young kids at home and she said, I really feel called to stay at home and help raise the kids, but I don't think we'll be able to afford it. And I said, well, will you let me go and know that I might have to be away more but I can guarantee you that I'll make the economics. And I started at that moment saying, okay, how can I do this? My career, I have to, you know, I had a good career. I need a great career because my wife, who's more talented than I am, is giving up her career for the family. I better produce, you know, and it freed me up in a, in a massive way. You know, in, in reading about your past that said that you did something at eBay called Little Fireside Chats. And I, and I want people to know that as much as the book allows us to know that we can you know, work in so many different fashions, there still is nothing like this one-on-one -on -one relationship okay. of people. And, and you make it clear, but what, the thing that took my attention, that caught my eye was this. I talked about the value of infusing integrity in everything you do. Being trustworthy is crucial to success in life and in your career. And so many people, they, and people know inherently whether to trust you or not. And the fireside chat started at eBay when I, I had the HR organization in my COO role and I felt like I should do more than just put policies and practices in place. I wanted to do something that was personal. And I'm a wicked introvert. So I said, well, I'm gonna go do these fireside chats and share my secrets or what I learned with small groups of people. There was something though that almost makes me now think of how that was inspired. And it was, I don't know if he was a mentor of yours or you just mentioned him. His name was John Martone, I believe, or Maritone, something. Martone. John Martone. And he told you to walk with purpose as though I knew where I was going. Yeah, he was, he, he told me something even funnier that the co-author, Carly Adler, who is fabulous, was mad at me when I told somebody this and I hadn't told her because she tried to put everything in the book. Uh, and and. There was an even more impressive thing he told me, which was, you know, Maynard, that pink leisure suit that you're wearing at IBM <laughs> probably ought to go away. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he was right. And then he said, but I have a few suits that I don't fit me anymore. You can get them tailored. Would you like them? I was, I was blown away. I didn't have much money. I took them and, you know, so he was, unbelievable to me and what he's he also said he helped me on my writing to be more crisp and he said you know nobody knows at IBM when you walk out of your office or you know wherever you are where you're going but they know whether or not you're inspired and in a hurry to get there so when you get out in the hall don't dawdle look like you have somewhere to go and so I started walking faster and moving faster I haven't slowed down yet you know, Maynard, I, I forgot to ask you this before, and I usually ask my guests beforehand, but I'll ask you now, and if you say no, then I'll just cut it out, okay? Right. But I, I would like to, if I give out your website, Rebooting Work, yep. would you respond to people if they would go through? Th totally. To I, look, I am, I am called to help people. Then perfect. I'm going to do it then, okay? It's, it's real simple. It's www.rebootingwork.com, so it can't be Absolutely. any easier than that. But I want to follow up with this again, just because it's, I guess that when I soul search, it's something I've felt internally. Replace every I can't with how can I. Exactly. I just think 
words are so powerful. Uh, you take words like inspiration or um, being an entrepreneur, and everybody gets all excited, and they see that as something light and airy, and you take something like operational excellence, and people get, oh my God, somebody's gonna put metrics on me and make me do something. And I would argue that you, know, you can probably have more impact in your career by being operationally excellent than dreaming up what you're gonna do and maybe having that work or not work. So I think words are so, more power, are so much more powerful than we think about it. And when you say, I can't, you're in a negative point of view. And it, when you go to, I wonder what I'm supposed to learn from this, or how can I do this? You're in a positive place trying to solve a problem instead of run away from a problem. And it also forces you to do this other thing that you said and I have always believed in. We live in fear of making mistakes, but real growth comes when we are not in our comfort zone. And that's the way to get out of the comfort zone. Absolutely. You know, we all need to be pushed. If we stay in our comfort zone, we, well, all you have to think of is your own career. Where did you learn the most? Where did you grow the most? It wasn't in a time that was easy. It's generally in a time that's hard. What you look back on in your career and you brag about the most are not the times that you were in and out at nine to five and everything was sailing along easily. It's when you had to do something that was challenging. And do you say, and this has been a, a mantra of my, my own teachings to my own children, the results of resilience are nothing short of breathtaking. So if you can make those mistakes, no matter how many times you make them right. and you bounce back up, the results of that are, I always tell my kids, are way better than not making the mistakes. Make as many as you can. Just right. keep bouncing back up. Totally. Everybody in life gets body blows. The question is how you deal with those body blows and do you let that disable you or do you get that, you get even more fired up to go do, do more. In my career, I, got to, I had to go in the back door of every company that I joined because I came in as an underdog and didn't have the right pedigree and um, you know, I, I didn't get invited in. Please come into the front room. I invited myself in through the kitchen and then just worked hard. and. Uh, did a good job, and then if I liked what I was doing, I'd knock on the door and say, I can do that job as well. well. But that's not your job. Well, no one else is doing that. I'll do my job as well. How about I do both of them, you know, and moved on. You know, it's how I got my first job. I literally told the guy, I see nobody cleaning the floors and pulling the cable. <laughs> he made me a news anchor. That's <laughs> because, awesome. Because, you know, it, but that's what it is. It requires you to go in there, take the chance. Even you said in, in, in the book, oftentimes you had to take jobs that you had no clue, you weren't prepared for it, but you saw the opening. I had to do that also, and so I was able to relate to that feeling, and it's not that frightening when you look at it with exhilaration. Oh, I was, I, I am sure that the manager I had at IBM in Charlotte, North Carolina, went home with a headache after he managed me for a little while because <laughs> I had a job that was pretty full-time, you know, and was supposed to be a full-time job. And I was doing that well and getting good grades on doing that. But I wasn't happy. I wanted to be in computer security. And they, at that time, this was in the early 80s, it was not as cool a job as it is today where China is trying to hack into everybody and all that good stuff. But it was still very important. And I said, I could do that job. And I went to my boss and I said, I want, I want to do that job. Uh, he said, you're not qualified. I said, I know, but no one else is doing it. I'm not asking you to give me more money. I'm not asking you to give me the title. I'm asking if I can help you do that and still do my other job. He's like, you're not qualified. I said, I know, but I can do it. And wow. so somebody came down. I did another special assignment for somebody from corporate. And they came in and they were beating my manager up because they hadn't filled the job. And he said, why don't you give that kid Webb a chance? And so he reluctantly did. And within two years, I was traveling all over the country breaking systems, which was awesome. And then I had to start fixing them, and that's how the rest of the career happened. Maynard, I, I could talk to you forever. I just got the signal, our time is up, and I'm gonna end with these words. Sometimes it just takes the right attitude and the confidence to know that the old way isn't necessarily the right way, and the belief that better days 
are always ahead. And Maynard, I want to thank you for shedding the light on those better days. Barry, I've enjoyed this so much. You're amazing and an inspiration to me. Oh, thank you, and thank you for joining us. Now, before Maynard leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Rebooting Work. And way, <laughs> what's so perfect is Maynard just said them. The times I've been thrown a curveball or knocked down have been just as influential, perhaps more influential, in determining the ultimate outcome of my life. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between the curves and the knockdowns that we all will face, better days are always ahead. Thank you so much, Maynard. Thank you, Barry. My that was pleasure. Fun. I'm amazing. If you'd like to get in touch with us, want a DVD or transcript of our show, catch an episode online, or receive our weekly updates, go to www.klcs.org slash btl. Closed captioning is made possible by The Intelligent Optimist, your source for stories and events about possibilities and solutions. Get to know our magazine and visit us at TheOptimist.com. Intelligent Optimism, a way of life. What I really want is for people's dreams to get married up with the reality of where they are and realize there's more in all of us and we can achieve more. On this episode of Between the Lines, a new way of looking at your work and your life with my guest, Maynard Webb. With his book, Rebooting Work, he shares his knowledge on how to transform how you work and how you can become the CEO of your own destiny.